Good morning, everybody. Hope you guys are all doing good. Go ahead and get started. So from scan to CNC with Creaform and Roland. Uh, so first off, um, quick overview. We're, we'll talk about the advantages of scan to CNC. Uh, I do have to go over the Creaform 3D scanners, just make sure everyone knows what we're talking about, the product line. Uh, then we'll actually do a little bit of scanning and creating a 3D model go through that process. Uh, then we'll talk about Roland desktop CNC machines, quickly go over their product line. Uh, and then finally prepare a, a model for machining and kind of just go through that whole process. So, so we'll start off with talking about the advantages. So first off, what do we mean by scan to CNC? Uh, if you're not familiar with, we're talking about going from 3D scanning a part um, to directly to CNC machining that part without needing to do a bunch of complex and lengthy CAD modeling. So, you know, some complex parts can take hours or days uh, to model in SOLIDWORKS or whatever you're modeling in. Um, so this process is more about being able to just scan, clean up the scan, have a full 3D model ready to go, and then seeing, seeing that model right off the bat. So saving you a lot of time and eventually saving you a lot of money in that process. The reason why we'd want to be able to do the scan to CNC process because it allows us to quickly reproduce geometries uh, when we don't have any CAD data available. So maybe it's something that's handmade or something that's older and just hasn't had any, um, you know, any, any CAD data made in the past. Uh, so being able to use the 3D scanning just means we can uh, bring that, all that data into our computer, digitize it, and have a full 3D model um, and not have to even touch SOLIDWORKS that sometimes. Um, and so with the, and then with the, with the CNC, we can create a lot of uh, very inexpensive custom molds or fixtures um, or even the parts themselves. Um, maybe the fixtures that are for parts that are difficult to hold uh, can be a huge advantage uh, when you're doing something like that. So being able to scan and actually replicate uh, the data from your part, maybe it's a part that you're, you're doing some operations on, some assembly features, things like that. Um, being, able to, being able to create a custom form-fitting mold for that product uh, for use of assembly or operations uh, can be really helpful, really advantageous in that manufacturing process. Uh, so it's a, this is a great fit when we're dealing with organic shapes, uh, anything that's curved or round that can be really hard to measure. Um, if we're trying to create custom molds or, like I said, some form-fitting fixtures, uh, yes, we could see it, we could um, uh, 3D print those fixtures, but if it's a large, big, bulky object, um, you know, we wouldn't want to waste the time and waste the money uh, to print more than we need to. Uh, again, for, this is good for when we don't have any CAD data at all. If we had the CAD data, we wouldn't need to scan it. Um, and again, any handmade objects or if there's a uh, material specific application, you know, a material that just isn't available for 3D printing, but that you can see and see. So before we get into it, I have to talk about the scanners, make sure we all are on the same page of how 3D scanning works. So I'll try to cover this stuff fairly quickly. We don't have a ton of time. Uh, but Creaform, they're a manufacturer of portable 3D scanners. They have some handheld scanners. Um, they have portable CMM and a lot of different, um, lot of different machines for different operations. So we're pretty much going to focus on the handheld devices. Today we're going to be looking at uh, just the GoScan and the HandyScan. So starting off with the GoScan, uh, it's a versatile product. It's self-positioning, so if you're familiar with 3D scanning at all, there's always two things going on. You always have to, uh, the scanner has to position itself in space so it knows where it's at, uh, and then it collects data. And then with both of those two things going on at once, it can actually create this 3D model. So the GoScan will collect color data, color and texture, as well as the actual 3D model itself. So the way the GoScan positions has a, what's known as a high intelligent hybrid positioning. So it can use uh, geometry, so the actual geometry of what you're scanning. So in this case, it's kind of those ribs on the front of the seat. Uh, it can use color or texture detail. So like this flame detail on the side, that you can see these little squares are actually being used to position, like triangulating essentially. Uh, and then for parts where we don't have any color or feature, we can use uh, our targets, which are uh, infrared reflective targets. And so it's using those targets or using all those data points to sort of triangulate where it's at in space so that I can start collecting data. And now we have the Handy Scan. Handy Scan is our laser scanner. So this is a metrology grade scanner. So we see this being used for all sorts of applications, whether it's 
reverse engineering or inspection. Uh, but this one does not use a white light like the GO scan. This one uses lasers. So on these parts, it's not co collecting any color data, uh, just geometry. So we have to use the, the infrared targets again. And basically, it's tracking those targets, using those for triangulation purposes to create an origin. And then it's using the lasers to actually collect our data, collect our geometry. So there's a lot more products out there for Creoform for smaller or larger applications, but those are the two that we're going to be kind of paying attention to today when it comes to scan to CNC. All right, so now we can actually get into the scanning process and creating a 3D model. So for this project, I, I found the first thing I could find in my office that was sort of hard to measure, uh, and it was a spike sheet. So this is organic, it's a very curved shape. Uh, if I was just trying, if all I had was a pair of calipers and I was trying to reverse engineer this or reproduce this bike seat, it would be pretty hard. There's a lot of curved surfaces, radiuses. Um, it wouldn't be very easy to make very accurately off the top of my head. So that's where 3D scanning really comes into play and works out very well. So a quick little video of the actual, this is the actual scanning process. So you can see here, once I've uh, started my scan, I just go ahead and it's kind of just painting around the seat. So I'm just acquiring all this data. You can see that plane there is a clipping plane. I've generated that, so I'm not grabbing anything below that clipping plane, like the table. As you can see, as the, uh, as the targets start to light up red, that just means that we're identifying those, using those for triangulation. And the whole process is just pretty quick. It's just going around and collecting all the data you want. That bar on the left there is just helping me position the scanner, either uh, too, if it's too close or too far away, it's kind of trying to keep it in between the two yellow arrows there. And you just go around, grab all the surfaces you want, and you can get as much or as little data as you need. In this case, my thought was that I just wanted the top of the seat and wasn't so concerned about the, the bottom. So once I felt like I had all the data I needed, I can just stop the scan right there let it process, and then go on to actually complete it, make it a full 3D model. So there's my scanned part. So now I need to prepare this model. I, I can't just see and see a, a rough STL or a rough mesh file like that. So what I'm gonna do is gonna clean up the model and make it a full uh, watertight solid model. So the first thing I can just go do, and this is, again, sorry, I didn't mention, this is Creaform's software as well. So it's the Creaform scanner and their software. So I can just go and clean up this model real quick, delete some of the extraneous data out of the way. And now that I've cleared all that out of the way, I can go and sort of fine tune the edges, smooth out the boundary a little bit using this edit boundary tool. What I have to do is just select the boundary and it'll automatically kind of test that curve and smooth it out when I apply it. So you can see that all those edges are not, not nearly as rough as they used to be. So that'll make it a lot easier to clean. So now I can use this automatic clean mesh function to sort of clean up. It'll get rid of some of the spikes, self-intersections, any weird irregularities uh, in the file. Might not have noticed anything, but trust me, something happened. Uh, and now we can close this up. So you can see it's just a surface right now. It's not a closed body. Wouldn't be ideal if you were trying to CNC this or, or 3D print it. So I can use this fill hole command and I can patch this up. So I'm gonna do a partial fill, which allows me to control how it fills this boundary. So all I have to do is select a first point, a last point, and somewhere in the middle, wherever there, and it will kind of connect the dots and create a patch. It's not a nice flat, flat patch there. Now for the rest of that, I'll just do a normal hole fill and select the boundary and it'll fill it up nice and smooth. So that's really all it takes uh, in some cases. You know, in this case, it was just two big holes to fill and we have a full three-dimensional model. Now, you always wanna double check that you have a good watertight model before you bring it in. So there is a watertight remesh, but as you can see, my model is already watertight and doesn't need to be remeshed or anything like that. So that's pretty much all it takes um, from the Creoform side. Obviously, if you have a more complex part, you might have some more holes to fill, you might have some more data to delete, 
Um, but for a simple part like this, it doesn't take any time at all. So now we've done the scanning, uh, and now we can just go straight to um, using that 3D model that we just made and being able to CNC it using uh, Roland's CNC machines and Roland's software. So quickly, I need to talk about Roland. Roland desktop CNC machines. Now these aren't your giant CNC machines that you have to see on a shop floor. These are more uh, office friendly CNC machines. These are your desktop sized ones. So these machines uh, are really friendly and easy to use. So really it's for anyone who uh, has a lot of experience with CNC or has no experience whatsoever. Um, it's subtractive rapid prototyping. So these are 3D printers and they really fit any sort of office or home or even classroom environment. Uh, the, e the ease of use is really because of their SRP player software. So that's sort of their, their CAM software. Um, it outputs, outputs uh, RML, which is their role in machine language. Uh, but really you don't need, it's no G coding or anything like that. You don't have to have all that. You don't have, any, you don't have to have any of that prior experience or knowledge um, to be able to create these programs. And we'll go through those steps, how they work. Uh, first, so the MDX50 is what I did my project on that we're gonna go, go through today. Um, it has an automatic tool changer built in and accepts that RML code and also does accept G code if you do have some other CAM software uh, available to you. Uh, and also it comes with an optional rotary fourth axis, which would be really cool um, for doing top and bottom of parts or doing some rotary style parts. Not a lathe per se, but it's a fourth rotary axis. The other focus uh, on the Roland CNC product line is the MDX540. So this has a much larger process area up to 20 inches by it's about, about 20 to 15 by six. Um, it also has a four position uh, tool changer as well. Um, and it also, again, also accepts RML code and the G code in an optional rotary fourth axis. Uh, this machine can also cut um, uh, non-ferrous metal. So aluminum, copper, brass, things like that. Um, the MDX50 and the other products are mostly for plastics, plastics and woods, no, no metals in those machines. Uh, but the NDX540 can do those non-ferrous metals. So why would you want to do CNC? You know, we, of course, we have 3D printing available, available to us. We have some other uh, manufacturing process available to us. Well, Roland CNC machines are a lot, really do have a much tighter tolerance than some of the 3D printers out there, which allows you to do parts that it can be even snap fit or exact in stable forms. Uh, I think a big advantage to CNC can be the materials. You know, you can cut whatever material you have available to. You're not limited to, you know, your 3D printing material. You're not limited to just using tool steel or, uh, you know, 4140. You can use whatever material you have available to you, which really opens up the uh, applications you have. Uh, as an example of, you know, being able to do some CNC in-house versus actually um, going through an outside machine shop, uh, tooling board material can cost as little as $20, um, and then the little bit of labor it might take to do some post-processing in-house uh, means your internal cost could be for a fixed ring prototype like this, you can see on the right, it can only be about 50 bucks. Whereas if you were to go through an outside machine shop, um, the quota cost for something like this could be around $375. Uh, but not only that, it could take two, three, four weeks for you to get these parts back. Whereas doing it in-house, you can see the part build time for this is only about four hours. Post-processing, maybe another hour. So you can have this part same day if you do it in-house and save over $200. So uh, doing some of these prototypes and fixtures and jigs and things like that in-house with uh, a rolling CNC machine can really save you quite a bit of time, quite a bit of money. And again, we're kind of talking about 3D printing. You know, 3D printing is great for complex parts. Uh, you know, something like this, you can see this picture, there's no way you're seeing seeing this. Only 3D printing is going to be able to produce something like that, and that's great. But not all parts need to be optimized. Not all parts are that complex. Uh, so with something as big, bulky, and blocky like this, you know, I don't need to completely optimize it for 3D printing and try to reduce as much material as I can. Uh, sometimes just leaving it as is is good enough, and the cost difference can be pretty large, you know, for for 3D printing cost and time. So. Um, you know, as a part gets bigger, that's, uh, the more volume there is, the longer it takes when it comes to 3D printing. But with CNC, the, the, the more volume there is, the, the less material you have to remove, the less time it takes. So with something that's bulky or large, 
sequencing can really be a pretty cost viable option. So I can quickly go through now the uh, preparing this model for machining. So Roland's signature SRP player software that I mentioned breaks down uh, setting up milling, the milling program into really five simple steps. Um, it allows you to not have any experience at all and be able to produce a part, but it still has the advanced capabilities of editing tool paths and things like that if you do have some experience and you're trying to do some advanced operations. So the first step is we'll bring in our 3D model here. You can see that. Uh, we just open the model. We can orient it the way we want, rotate it, um, and we can resize it, or we can just leave it as the size that we scanned it. And then step two says type of milling. So this is kind of the bread and butter. This is re really simple questions. It's asking, do you want a better surface finish or a faster cutting time? You know, anyone can really make an assumption of what they're looking for, uh, but there's a lot going on between those two different options. A better surface finish is going to use a uh, smaller tool. So instead of your entire part being cut with a quarter inch bit, you know, it may cut with a 16th inch ball end mill uh, and reduce the, uh, increase the number of iterations and, re and reduce the layer height and all that sorts of stuff. Um, so there's some, some good information going on in there, but it's easy to choose whether or not you want it. Do you want it faster or do you want it better looking? Uh, and this next is model, does your model have many flat planes or many curved surfaces? Again, pretty straightforward. Anyone can decide looking at their part, which is more appropriate, but there's a lot more going on behind the scenes with those two selections that SRP player will automatically adjust parameters for. And the next thing is going to be asking your cylindrical work piece or a block work piece. So that's whether or not you're putting in a, a big cube or a rectangular prism in there, or you're putting in some sort of cylindrical piece doing some uh, circumferential operations or things like that. Uh, and with that, we can tell it whether or not we're cutting top or bottom, uh, or top only or top and bottom. So this is for having that fourth rotary axis. So if we are cutting top and bottom, it's going to automatically do a roughing pass and a finishing pass, finishing pass for the top. It'll rotate 180 degrees, and it'll do a roughing and a finishing for the bottom of the model as well. And then with that, we can also have it automatically generate some supports as well. So the support the supports are kind of cool. We don't have to design in supports uh, in SOLIDWORKS or anything like that. Um, we can use their built-in supports and adjust their widths and their heights and where they're located uh, so that our part doesn't just drop through the machine. Uh, step three is going to be to create a toolpath. And what's nice about this is you really don't have to know, again, you don't have to know anything about tool paths or CNC. You just have to select, okay, here's the type of material I'm working with, whether it's acrylic or milling foam. You just put in the dimensions of your workpiece, and then you can create, you can click create tool path and all the tool paths we made. Uh, but if you go into edit, there's a lot more functionality in there. You can adjust the number of finishing passes. You can adjust the tools being used uh, in each pass, the cutting parameters, the type of cutting, you can adjust the margins, all sorts of things that you can still have the ability to do, but you don't have to take that in consideration. You can just click Create Tool Paths, and it'll pretty much optimize it for a good part. And then you can see here, this next one is the preview results. Gives you a rough but fairly accurate uh, simulation of, of your model. It'll give you an estimated cutting time um, and give you some other options there if, if you're Say if you're, you can see from the model that your cutting doesn't reach the bottom of the surface, you can click that hint, and it'll give you an explanation of why that might be. You know, perhaps you need to adjust some of the cutting parameters in there, and it'll give you some advice and suggestions um, to, of cutting parameters to change so you can fully get your part. Um, things like a corner remains un uncut. Perhaps you need to just go in and select a new tool, a smaller tool, going from a quarter inch to an eighth inch tool um, so you can get in some of those corners, things like that. So. Pretty handy, pretty straightforward. And then finally, perform the cutting. Uh, you can see here, this is Edit Magazine. So there is, with the MDX50 at least, there's a, um, a six tool automatic changer. So we call that a magazine. We can go and edit what tools are in there. And uh, from generating this program, it automatically knows, all right, here are the tools that I need to use. We have a, in stock number two, we need a quarter inch ball. And in stock number four, we need an eighth inch ball. So it's pretty straightforward to see, oh, okay, those are the tools that this program is going to go use. 
I'm going to go check my magazine and make sure the tools are in there. Again, straightforward, easy to learn for anyone can use that. So I could go from there. I could just cut that part that I had, but I want to take it a step further since we're talking about all the, the cool advantages that uh, scanning and scheme seeing have together. So what I'm going to do is make more of this form-fitting mold or that fixture that I was talking about. So you can do this uh, in any program that has any sort of uh, mesh body manipulation. SolidWorks 2018 and 2019 can do some mesh body functions, uh, but there's a lot of other software out there that more 3D printing related, but anything that, any, anything that works with SCLs will do this pretty well. Uh, so what I did is, like you can see, I took my seat, I flipped it over, and I sort of um, merged it, or it looks like it's about to be merged with that block there. So all I have to do is what we call a Boolean operation, and I remove the seat, and where it intersects with the box, you see I have that negative of the mold now. So now this is kind of creating a mold, or it's creating a, a form-fitting fixture for that seat to sit in. And so now I can just go through that, basically that same process. I can bring that mold into SRP Player and do the same thing I just did with the seat itself. I can adjust the tool paths if I need to, and I can create that full form and fit. So that's what I did here. So you can see this is the MDX50, with right now it's cutting with a quarter inch round end mill, and it's just doing the roughing pass for this seat mold. I think in this case I did have, I had to scale it down a little bit for this purpose, but so you can see I had that's the uh, rotary axis I have installed. If I wanted to do it full size, I would just take the rotary axis out and use the normal tooling board to put a larger block of uh, milling foam in there, and then I could have done a full size seat. So the automatic tool changing. So when it goes, when it's done with that roughing pass and it goes into the finishing pass, it doesn't pause. It just goes and drops off that quarter inch bit, picks up the new tool, and keeps going. So that whole process took only about 30 minutes uh, cutting wise. So in 30 minutes, I was able to cut an accurate mold or this form fitting fixture. Say if you were doing some of those assembly operations on it uh, for this block of milling foam under $10. And as you can see, that's scanning and model prep time only took about 30 minutes, it, it really not even that. Cutting time was around 30 minutes, so I'd say a rough estimate of the total time to part for this entire project was only about an hour. Uh, so you can see how that can really save you some time than if you're outsourcing your CNCing or even something like this, this block. Uh, 3D printing this block would definitely not cost you $10. It would cost you a little bit more if you weren't optimizing it for 3D printing. And to print something like this that was, you know, an inch and a half tall could take three, four, six hours. So this is a, a really good fit for something like this for this scan to CNC process. And I think uh, that's all I have. If, I think we have about five more minutes, so if anyone has any questions about that, uh, we do have some upcoming webcasts that we were talking about this month for the Design Innovation Summit. Mark, do you have any questions or things you want me to go over? I was just getting ready to chat you. It was a great presentation. I don't have any questions. I like the way you integrated uh, really several technologies, everything from SOLIDWORKS to CNC to scanning to STL manipulators. So a lot of products in there. Yeah, thank you. Good. Always glad to make you happy. <laughs> okay. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for spending the morning with us. We've got another webcast coming up this afternoon. It's on, I think, managing effective design tables inside of SOLIDWORKS. So if you're a SOLIDWORKS user and you want to learn about using design tables, feel free to register for that or just come on over and join the WebEx via the website. Thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you in another webcast.